Well, how are you guys doing? Now, the good news is I'm back at church. The, the bad news is not while you're there because you probably heard I, I have COVID. So I'm up at the church on Saturday filming this for Sunday. But we are back from vacation. I, I'm disappointed. I wanted to see you guys kick off a new series live with you guys. But I'm back, and hopefully next week uh, I'll be good to go. But anyway, we had a great time, and thank you so much for uh, allowing us to, to take a few weeks off and go on vacation. And while we were on vacation, we actually had a few days to spend in Rome, and we did a lot of the touristy stuff. We saw medieval buildings and uh, buildings from the Renaissance period. We saw ancient Roman ruins all the way back into Bible times and even before the New Testament was written. We, we saw pieces of pottery that were like 2,000 years old, which is pretty amazing because pottery is pretty fragile. And actually back in ancient Rome, when they made pottery, they made it very thin and that created a problem because sometimes during the curing process, it would crack. And some unscrupulous dealers, they would take wax and they would fill in those cracks with wax and put the pieces back together and then they'd paint over it and sell it as being pottery without any defects or flaws. The problem was when the buyer would get it home, they'd it'd set it out in the heat of the sun and the wax would melt and you would see the flaws and it would be worthless because it couldn't hold water or any other liquids. And so this became a real problem in Rome. So some of the, the more uh, important sellers that uh, did things the right way, they began to stamp the word Sinacera on the bottom of their pottery. And literally that word meant without wax. And what they were telling the buyer is this is without defect. And Sinacera, that Latin word has become our English word, sincere. And sincere means to be real not hiding behind a fake facade or a false exterior. Well, today we're kicking off a brand new sermon series where the, for the next few weeks, we're gonna be going uh, through the book of James. And I'm really excited about that new series, but I'm gonna warn you, this book doesn't pull any punches. It challenges us not to put on fake religion and to, that looks good on the outside, that may impress other people, but becomes worthless under pressure because it melts like wax and we submit to temptation and hardship. The book was a letter written by uh, James, the earthly brother of Jesus. He was the son of Joseph and Mary. Now, what's interesting is James, like all of Jesus' other brothers, they didn't actually believe that he was the son of God during his ministry. And before you're too hard on James about that, just imagine if your older brother told you that he was the Messiah, you'd probably have some doubts too. But after Jesus rises from the dead, James is all in. I mean, seeing somebody come back from the dead, it'll, it'll change a man. And, and so at this point... He becomes an early leader of the church in Jerusalem. And in about 45 AD, he writes this letter to Christians around the Roman Empire. And keep in mind that this letter was probably written less than 15 years after Jesus rose from the dead. Well, if I had to sum up the overall theme of this book or this letter of James, it would be have a sincere faith. Christianity should be who we are. It, it should be it should affect and control every aspect of our lives. It should influence and affect our parenting, our marriages, our voting, our work, our relaxation time. It should be the primary focus of our entire lives. But it's a tough book to study. And I'm going to warn you, some of you may feel like this book causes the church to mess in some areas that you kind of think are off limits. But James's point is, if you have a sincere faith in Jesus, there are no off limits areas because you've given everything to Jesus. Well, let's dive into James chapter 1. Look at the introduction in verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Now, James is the half-brother of Jesus. He grew up with him, but look how he introduces himself. He only identifies himself as a servant of God and as of the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, if I were the brother of Jesus, <laughs> like I'd tell everybody, I'd have business cards printed up, pastor, attorney brother of Jesus. I'd work it somehow into every sermon. You know, as Jesus said in Matthew 27, and he, well, I mean, he also said to me when we were hanging out in the backyard, because, you know, we're brothers. And, and I'd probably try to argue that the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept, that Jesus actually, that came up when I, I threw my fastball past Jesus in the Little League All-Star game. But, but that's not what James does. He says he is a servant of Jesus. And if we look at the word here, back in the Greek for servant, it's the word doulos. And it's actually not servant. Doulos means a voluntary slave. What James is saying is he voluntarily gave up his life, his own will and his own purpose for the plan and purpose of Jesus. All right, look at verses two through four. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. 
Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. Boy, how's that for a depressing way to start a sermon? Come on, James, encourage us a little bit here. Tell us that everything's going to be all right. We're going to be healthy and wealthy because you know Jesus loves us. That's not what he does. He says, consider it pure joy when you suffer. What James is saying here is that we are going to suffer hardship, difficulty. This life isn't going to be easy. We're going to experience storms. You can't control that. But what you can control is whether you're beaten by the storm or you're strengthened by the storm. A couple of weeks ago during our vacation, we were on a cruise and Lil and I would walked out onto the deck and we decided to go to the pool. And so we went out to the pool deck and uh, looked for some chairs and we couldn't find any chairs that were empty. So we went up uh, some stairs to the, the next deck that was kind of an oval deck that was almost like a balcony overlooking the pool. We found some chairs up there and we, we sat down and to catch some rays and relax a little bit. And uh, we'd been there a few minutes and this young guy comes running by. And this oval deck was also about a quarter mile track for you to walk and run on. And it was obvious this guy was in great shape. This was not his first day to run. But we probably watched him run by us about 20 times. And it was interesting uh, when he first started, for the first six or seven laps, man, dude looked great. He looked like he was walking in the mall in the cool of the AC. But after about six or seven laps, it started getting a little tougher. At that point, he had a, a smile on his face and he had joy in his heart. But by the 12th lap, he was struggling a little bit. He began, you could see the effect on him. But by about the 15th or 16th lap, dude looked like me running up a flight of stairs. I mean, he was tired. He was sweating a little bit. And, and by the time he was finished, there was no joy in his heart. He, he was struggling to breathe, sweating heavily and looked ready to collapse. And as I watched him do that workout, I realized it was really those last laps that caused him to get into better shape. The first 10 laps or so, that was really just to maintain the conditioning he already had. But at, but at the point he got towards the end, he was building new muscle. He was strengthening his cardiac system. He was getting in better shape. You know, and that's how hardship and difficulty works with our faith. When our faith remains strong during storms in life, we have more confidence in the strength of our faith. It grows. We realize that with God's help, we can handle anything. We can handle things that we never realized we could deal with before. That's what James is talking about here. He says we learn to persevere when our faith is tested. We grow stronger through the st struggle. James says, consider it pure joy when you suffer. I'm gonna be honest, I'm not there yet. I, I'm not, I don't consider it pure joy, but what I know is that we are gonna struggle in this life. We are gonna have times of difficulty and hardship. And it's how we handle that suffering and how we handle that difficulty that separates us from non-believers. Our hope isn't in this world, it's in heaven. And if we live that through that difficulty and hardship correctly, we can be a witness to the world about what true faith looks like, what sincere faith looks like from a Christian. Now look, I, I'm not saying we should seek out persecution or seek out difficulty and hardship. That, that's not what I'm saying. But I am saying we shouldn't fear it. You know, that difficulty may come through a, a sudden medical condition. It may come through a financial burden. It, it may be some sort of punishment or some adversity you suffer because you're a Christian. We ought to consider it joy when we share our faith with somebody and they, they laugh at us or they turn us down. We should consider it a worthy suffering if we live out our holiness in Christ and it causes us to maybe lose a friend or to have a strained relationship with a family member, maybe even lose a job. When we persevere through difficulty, we grow more confident that we can handle whatever storm comes our way. We go stronger through the storms. All right, look at verses five through seven. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. This is a huge promise from God, and it's one that I rely on every single day. Uh, almost every day when I pray, I ask God for wisdom. I ask God to give me wisdom as a father, as a husband, as a preacher, as an attorney, as a leader. It, I ask for that every single day. And then when I go into a, maybe a difficult meeting or I'm getting ready for a difficult conversation, I pray for wisdom specifically in that circumstance. And what I've learned is when I do that, God grants that wisdom. He gives me wisdom beyond what I have on my own. Now, now let me be clear here. 
We're praying for wisdom, not knowledge. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. We can get knowledge from books and training, but wisdom comes from God. Knowledge is raw information, but wisdom is showing us how to use that information. Someone once said that knowledge is the ability to take things apart, but wisdom is knowing how to put it all back together. You can have lots of book knowledge and have no idea what to do with that. Wisdom comes from God. Look, look back at verse 5. It says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. That first part, if any of you lacks wisdom, is saying we need to ask for wisdom in a humble way. We don't need to go to God going, hey, I've already got lots of wisdom, but give me a little more. We need to say, I can't achieve the results, the God-sized results I want to achieve without your wisdom, God. I'm a pretty smart dude, and I've handled a lot of difficult situations. But I realize that when I ask God for his wisdom for a particular situation, it generally goes better than if I tend to work out of my own strength. And, and so here's my challenge for you. I challenge you for the next 60 days to pray every single morning that God would give you wisdom for that day. That he'd give you wisdom in specific areas of your life. And at the end of that 60 days, I want you to let me know if you think God has actually answered that prayer because God gives wisdom. But remember, you've got to ask with faith. Paul, uh, James says if you, if you ask without any faith, you're not going to get it because you're just like a wave being tossed around by the changing winds. All right, look at verses 9 through 12. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. It blossoms, its blossoms fall, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So James is going to change topics here, and he's going to talk about what I think may be one of the biggest issues that keeps us from living a sincere Christian life. He's talking about money here. He says, it's more difficult for a rich person to have a sincere faith than a poor person. Now look, before you get irritated at James about saying that rich people have a hard time following Jesus, remember, Jesus said the same thing several times in several different ways. He says it this way in Matthew 19, 23 through 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus talks about wealth and money all the time. But what's interesting is the Bible has no record of Jesus ever taking up an offering. Jesus wasn't interested in their pocketbooks. He didn't want their money. He wanted their hearts. He wanted them to be committed followers who gave them every aspect of their lives. And he wants us to have a complete and sincere faith. Now, some of you guys, you hear those scriptures about wealth and you breathe a little sigh of relief and you feel pretty good about yourself because you know you're not wealthy. Well, don't be too quick to let yourself off the hook. A 2018 Global Health Report shows that if you have a total net worth of $93,170, now that's your house, whatever equity you have, cars, savings account, retirement account, you put all that stuff together, if it adds up to about $93,000, you're in the top 10% of the most wealthy people in the entire world. Well, let's say you don't fit that. Well, do you have $4,210 to your name with all of that? That puts you in the top 50%. So if your car is parked outside with a full tank of gas, you're getting pretty close to the 50% mark in world wealth. When James challenges the rich here, he's not talking to billionaires. He's talking to those of us who don't have a daily struggle about what we're going to eat and where we're going to sleep. I've been on mission trips to the Philippines and to Uganda, Africa, and I've met Christians who are in very different situations than us. They live a kind of poorness that we don't see that much in this country. They may have food for today and maybe tomorrow, but that's it. And they've got to rely on God for the day after that. They live in sh little shacks that are so small that they have to take their bed mats out so that they can sit in their house. It's a very different life. But what, I, what we see is, even with that, they have this incredible trust in God. And they're very generous with one another. They share with one another. They even shared with us when we'd go visit them. So we'd go to a house where they had this little shack and maybe four or five chickens. Now that's their total net worth. And we'd get there and when we'd leave, they'd give us a chicken. Now, that's a big deal for them. It'd be like saying, hey, thanks for coming over for Saturday night barbecue. Hey, take, take the car. 
That's the equivalent of what that is. They have a daily dependence on God because they don't know where their food's coming from. And because of that, they get to see God move in ways that we don't get to see very often in America. My family could probably last a month without even having to go to the grocery store. And if we have to go to the grocery store, we know we can afford to buy more food. When James talks about money, he's not taking up an offering. He's not trying to make us poor. He's challenging our lack of daily dependence on God. He's saying that our wealth is ultimately going to fail us. And here recently, we kind of see that's true a little bit. I mean, we've seen the stock market really crash. And so you've watched your portfolio or your retirement account go down. Inflation has caused the dollar to not feel like it buys nearly as much as it used to. And we know you can't take it with us. The reality is this, one day that wealth will fail you. Because at the end of time, when you stand before Jesus, the only thing that's gonna matter is the sincerity of your faith in him. It's not gonna matter how much money you had. It's not gonna matter how many likes or friends or followers you had on social media. It's not gonna matter what your social standing is in the community. The only thing that's gonna matter is your faith in Jesus and your relationship with him. And then the Bible says that really all that's gonna matter for the rest of your eternity is what Jesus says when you stand in front of him. Does he say, well done, good and faithful servant? Or does he say, depart from me, because I never knew who you were? I told you, I wasn't kidding when I said James doesn't pull any punches. You think that's bad, wait till, wait till next week. For those of us that are rich, which is most of us, we have to kind of go out of our way to make sure we're putting our faith in Jesus and not our pocketbooks. And for me and for Lil, that means that we've got to give 10% of our gross income back to this church. It means that after we pay taxes, we've got to be generous with the people around us, with our friends, with our family members, with coworkers, with people we don't even know, with mission partners, so that we're generous with God. It also means that Lil and I work for Kara City for free. We don't take any income because we know God has blessed us incredibly in this area of our finances. But I'll be honest, even doing those things, sometimes I still put my faith in my own finances rather than Jesus. It's hard for rich people to have a sincere faith. So let me ask you, where's your hope? Is it in Jesus or is it in your stuff? Is it in your retirement accounts and your investment portfolios? I kind of think that money is like an MRI for our heart. Man, it shows a clear picture of what's going on. So what's the diagnosis of your love for Jesus? What changes do you need to make to keep money from being where your hope is and where you put the sincerity of your faith? All right, look at verses 13 through 18. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it, full, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. You know, I often hear people say that they're being tempted by Jesus or tempted by God, and that's, that's bad theology. God does not tempt, nor can he be tempted. We're tempted by Satan, and we're tempted by our own evil desires, our human failings. See, God gives us perfect gifts that are intended to bring us joy and contentment. But Satan tries to lure us and trick us with little substitutes for the real thing that God gives. I grew up in rural northeast Texas where we have all these lakes around. And so I grew up freshwater fishing. And if you were going to bring home food to put on the table, you might fish for crappie or for catfish. But if you're fishing for sport, you're after the bass. And so if you want to be a real bass fisherman, you know, you can catch bass with minnows, with live bait, you know, or worms, but, but you're not a real sport fisherman. If you want to be a, a bass fisherman, yeah, you've got to catch them on artificial lures. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to spend some time up in East Texas and become a little more cultured because uh, you're missing out on some of that. But almost all the lures that we used were made to look like something real. So it might be a lure that looked like a worm or it was a lure that looked like a fish or maybe even insect. 
You're trying to trick that bass into thinking that he's going after the real thing, something that is good for him to eat. So if you're fishing with an artificial worm, you try to pull that worm slowly so it makes that little artificial worm kind of bob through the water. If you're fishing with uh, an artificial lure that looks like a small fish, you try to make it look like that fish is struggling and hurt. Looks like an easy meal for Mr. Bass. You're enticing him with an imitation of the real thing. But when he takes that lure and the hook sets, you drag him away and you put him in the boat. Maybe you take him home to eat or you put him up on the wall in your office. Yeah, this may have actually been a bad illustration for this morning because some of the dudes in the uh, audience are probably going, hey, I probably should have skipped church today and gone bass fishing. This is a good illustration of this passage because it's exactly what happens with us in temptation and sin. Look back at verses 14 and 15. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Almost every temptation we face is an imitation of some real gift from God. Let me give you an example. Lust is a temptation that Satan tries to lure us into sin. But sexual arousal and sexual uh, intimacy in the context of a marriage between one man and one woman, that's a gift from God. He gave us that. That is a good and perfect gift. That's the real thing that leads to a lifetime of joy and happiness, contentment. But then Satan entices us. He lures us away from the real thing with cheap substitutes like pornography and affairs and casual sexual relationships. They, they look like the real thing. They, they seem to offer intimacy and love, but it's not real. And there's a hook waiting for us. And when that hook is set, we get enticed away and we get drug away by that sin. And it can cause devastation in our lives. And ultimately, it can lead to, to death and spiritual heartache. Don't fall for the cheap substitutes that Satan uses for God's perfect gifts. And I don't think a 70-year-old man who's sitting there bouncing grandkids on his knee with his family around him at Christmas time ever thinks back and wishes he had left his wife for that woman 30 years ago that was flirting with him at the office. God's gifts give long-term contentment and joy. And sexual intimacy isn't the only example of how this enticement of sin works. God gave us the desire to work hard and to provide for our family. But then Satan gives us this, this artificial lure, this temptation to sin to make, that, to make money and work, to make it a cheap alternative for our Savior. Let me be clear here. Temptation is not sin. Temptation is the lure. It's what's leading us to sin. When we take the bait, when we get the hook, we've now committed sin. And when we get caught up in sin, we can't live an authentic Christian life. All right, look at verses 19 and 20. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. James says, be quick to listen and slow to speak. And that's one of those that I need to really focus on because I have a hard time with that. I don't listen very well. I like to talk. I, I think I have uh, good wisdom sometimes, especially with my kids. And so they'll tell me things and I'm probably not listening as well as I should. I'm, I'm ready to offer great fatherly advice and they may not take it very well because they know that I'm not really hearing what they're going through, that I'm not listening well and empathizing with their struggle. You may struggle with the same thing in your family. You need to work on being a quick listener and sometimes be a little slower to speak. This is also great instruction for how to think about social media. You know, we so often want to put our perspective on some difficult topic out there on social media. But before we hit post, we need to think about what do we think our little post is going to do? Do we think it's really going to change someone's mind about that important issue? Or do we think it's just going to cause people to become upset? Do we think it's just going to cause people that agree with us to start piling on with comments and shares and upset the other side? You may wonder sometimes why our church comments and posts about certain things and we don't about others. And it's because we have a real strategy with social media that we want to use that to inform and encourage, but not generally to offend people on difficult issues. Now, if you've been around our church for very long, you know that we're not afraid to tackle difficult issues, that we'll talk about hard topics. But we do that here in church because it's in a sermon where we can go into depth about why we believe what we believe, why God's heart is a certain way about a certain topic. 
We don't do that on social media because we don't have that same ability to explain God's heart. We want to make sure that we share God's truth with the heart of God, with mercy and love and forgiveness. Because the reality is this, if you can't share Jesus' truth with Jesus' heart, you probably just need to keep your mouth shut and your social media wall pretty empty. Be slow to speak and quick to listen. Also be very slow to anger. I'm becoming more and more convinced that righteous anger really doesn't exist for us as human beings. God in his perfection can have righteous anger because he doesn't get affected by emotion the way we do. But when we get angry so often in our human weakness, it causes us to respond to people and issues in ways that tear down, not build up. Look, I'm not saying that we can't be upset by sin, but I'm saying when we get upset by sin, we better be very careful to treat the sinner the way Jesus would, with love and compassion and forgive them. We need to love them right where they are. Then it's from that perspective that we can show truth, not from a perspective of moral pride and self-righteousness. If you want to be angry at sin, start by being angry at sin in your own heart. That's the place to have a righteous anger. Then you're going to have a better perspective to share God's truth with God's heart. You cannot live an authentic Christian life by calling out sin of the world around you while you're ignoring the sin in your own heart. That's the opposite of sincere faith. So if we want to talk about the sanctity of marriage between one man and one woman, then we should. And we better make sure that our marriages are sanctified. If we want to talk about the sanctity of life, and we should, and we better make sure we're working hard to make life better for the people around us. We need to be generous and sacrificial in our support of unwed mothers. We need to be championing adoption. We need to be encouraging improvements to foster care and be generous with those in need. Authentic Christianity isn't just speaking God's truth. It's working really hard to show love in those areas of truth that we stand for. It's about being active and making a difference. I may upset a few people here, but I'm gonna say it anyway. You know me uh, better than that at this point. You know I'm still gonna say it. A few days ago when I read about Roe v. Wade being overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court, initially I had this little moment of of quiet celebration that this was one little step, one little move forward in protecting God's creation and His image bearers. I didn't post my celebration on social media because I knew that couldn't accomplish anything. It wasn't going to help anything. It was only going to cause division and make people unhappy. But I found that my quiet celebration quickly turned to, I guess, pondering, sober reflection about the state of the church. And then it turned to sadness, and I actually shed a few tears about the state of our nation and our world. As a church, we can't sit back and wait for the Supreme Court to do stuff. We can't sit back and wait for state legislatures to do stuff. We have to be a light in a dark world. For those of you I didn't offend a minute ago, I may offend you now. The church is partially responsible for the state of America in this area. The old legalistic church filled with self-righteous truth and no grace or mercy, it's responsible for some abortions. When churches kick pregnant girls out of youth groups or out of church, we create a stigma that puts young men and women in a place they never imagined they could be they want to hide and cover up the mistake that they made. When we look at unwed mothers with judgment and condemnation rather than love, we push them right towards decisions that we're opposed to. When we preach judgment without mercy and forgiveness, we're pushing people away from the church. We're pushing them to hide their sin, even with desperate means. Churches have to be places where we can be sincere and honest about our sin and struggle so we can be healed and restored. Condemnation by the church breeds silence. And silence so often leads to death. As churches, we have to do better. Whether you agree with what the Supreme Court did or you disagree, doesn't matter. That's done. The question is, how will we respond as a church? We need to rally around women who have an unwanted pregnancy. We need to love them, help them, encourage them, support them, not tear them down and make them feel guilty and responsible and have shame. 
we have to do more as a church than we are. We're going to look for a new mission partner that we can partner with financially and that we can serve with, who serves in this area, who supports unwed moms and moms-to-be. It's time for us to do way more than sit on the sideline and talk about the sanctity of life. We've got to make sure we make life sanctified. That's the church's job. Supreme Court decisions and new laws cannot change people's heart. Only Jesus' love can do that. And it's Jesus' church with that same love that can change the world around us. That's authentic Christianity. All right, look at verse 21. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do you want to be an authentic Christian? Then rage against the sin in your own life. Have righteous anger at the sin that remains in your life. Seek it out and destroy it. That's the picture of authentic Christianity. But how do we do that? Look at verses 20 through 25. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. James says if you want to be authentic, if you want to think like Jesus, if you want to talk like Jesus, if you want to live like Jesus, you've got to know how Jesus thinks. You've got to know how Jesus talked. You've got to know how Jesus lived. And to do that, you've got to open up the Bible. You've got to get in there and see what it says. And here at Kara City, we want to do that. In about a month, we're going to kick off community groups. And so you can get together in homes with, with friends and other people from church, and you can share a meal together. You can have some laughs. But you can also open up God's Word and see what it has to say about how we live life. You'll also be here on every Sunday. Every Sunday, we preach from God's Word. The other thing, though, you need to do is you've got to learn how to read the Bible on your own. Don't use the lame excuse that you can't understand it. You can. And, and there's great resources to help you. You can get a daily devotional book that gives you a short passage of Scripture to read that gives you some help in understanding what you're reading and then gives you some questions to ask about your own life. One of my good friends here in the church is a guy named Kevin Hallis, if you know him. Every morning he sends me a text with a daily devotional. It's a short one-page daily devotional. I bet Kevin would be glad to send that to you if you ask as well. Those kind of devotionals help you understand what you're reading. But reading and understanding God's truth, unfortunately, that's only half the battle. You've also got to apply it in your life. You've got to put that knowledge to work. The Bible isn't just intended to be informational. It's tended to be, intended to be transformational. In other words, it's intended not for you to have book knowledge. It's intended to change who you are. You've probably heard me use this little algebra equation before, but it's a great way to remember what the Bible is intended to do here. I, I, I didn't make this up, but I think it's a great uh, little formula here. It, it says the Bible, when used correctly, it's information plus application equals transformation. In other words, when you learn that new information, when you learn what the Bible has to say and you apply it in your life, it begins to change who you are. All right, look at the end of James chapter 1. This is verses 26 through 27. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that our God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. These last two verses, James gives us a pretty good description of how we should live as authentic, sincere Christians and how we should strive to live as a church. You can't have sincere religion with fake Sunday church. You can't have real relationship with Jesus by playing church just on Sunday mornings. Sincere faith means being honest about your struggles means being honest about your sins so that we can encourage you, we can grow together. It means tiring ourselves out serving and loving one another. It means being a light in a very dark and broken world. I started out this sermon with an illustration about Roman pottery and the Latin phrase sanacera, which became our English word sincere. So often we, we cover up and we hide our faults and our failures. And historic church has really pushed us to that because we're supposed to be perfect, but we're not. Church has got to be a messy place because we're a messy people. We, we try to pass ourselves off on Sunday mornings as being without defect like that pottery. But if we don't have real faith, if it's based on fake faith, 
it's going to break down and fall apart when the going gets tough and when temptation enters our lives. If we have fake religion, it's going to leave us broken and falling apart. But if we work to be sincere in our faith as a church and as individual Christians, we can have a faith that lasts, that makes a difference. Church has to be a messy place because we're a messy people. Be sincere in your faith. I, I want to challenge us not to just play church on Sunday mornings, but to be the church, to be a light in the dark world. Be sincere, love like Jesus, because it's Jesus' love that changes hearts. And it's that same love when Jesus' church shows it to the world around us, can change everything. Let's pray.